We're bringing you a full edition this week to expose a deeply disturbing claim involving once abandoned children and orphans. And what those now grown children allege is a cover up of how they were abused. From the 1920s to as recently as the 1980s in Nova Scotia, there was a place that black children who had negligent parents or none at all were sent. Its name was taken from the segregated past, the home for colored children. Now remember, Nova Scotia's history with the descendants of freed slaves is not a proud one. Racism ran deep. These former residents of that home claim they were considered the throwaway children. And what they say they endured is difficult to hear. But it has taken years to work up the courage to say it and share it with Victor Malaric. Just outside Halifax, abandoned on a small hillside, stands what many call a house of horrors, the site of an historic cover-up. Many of the children who live behind these walls are still haunted by the memories of their lost childhoods. What we went through, we don't never get over that. Never. It doesn't go away. It was so horrific because every time I thought of it, I often thought, you know, I could end it all. It was hell living in that place for me. That place is called the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. Opened in 1921, for decades, it was the only institution in the province that would accept orphaned and abandoned black children. Thousands of children live behind these walls, from toddlers to teenagers. And they told me to shut up and stop my lies. And if I was ever say this lie again, I'm going to get a severe beating, worse than I ever had. This was supposed to be a symbol of the black community's dreams. Instead, for many former residents, it will always be home of their worst nightmares. In Montreal, Harriet Johnson is packing for a trip to confront the past she fled 30 years ago. She ran away from the home after what she claims was horrific abuse. Harriet was only seven years old when her poverty-stricken family had to give her up. So in 1976, a social worker arrived to take her to the orphanage. A lady came and had told me and my cousin that we're going to be going for ice cream. You were going to go for ice cream? Yes. Did this social worker ever come to see you, ever come to talk to you? No. Never I came never... to see how you were? No, I not, the last time I saw her is when she dropped us off at the home. So the social worker comes, tells you she's taking you for ice cream, dumps you in a home, and you never see her again. Exactly. For the seven-year-old Harriet, this orphanage was anything but a home. What was a typical day like in the home? Beatings. Beatings? Yes. That's typical? Typical. Beatings, no food. For what reason? Uh, we would get beatings for the least little thing, for mainly saying the word bloody. You would get beaten severely. Um, if you didn't have your hands behind your back, like into like a military stand, when you were speaking to the staff, you would get beat for that. And it wasn't uh, only by belts, it was also by uh, switches, sticks off of the branches outside, trees. Harriet says she remembers almost daily physical abuse and neglect. If this social worker who dropped you off there mm -hmm. had ever come to the home to talk to you, mm -hmm. what would you have said to her? I would have told her exactly what was going on. How we were being treated, how we were being beaten, how we were being called names, how we were going without food. So you never had an opportunity to tell anyone this? No, I didn't. Did you feel like you were out of sight, out of mind to the so-called child care system? I felt that I was invisible. Invisible, except to one of the staff. Harriet says she was about 10 years old when Georgie Williams assaulted her. This is you? This is me, yes. Just a little kid? Just a little kid. Georgie Williams, back then, he was a child care worker and also the home's driver. Harriet says that's why he had many opportunities to be alone with the girls. To go somewhere with Georgie Williams, he would request that somebody would have to do some kind of sexual favor for him. You never got a free ride. There was one ride that Harriet recalls ended with the total loss of her innocence. He went around the back and told me to get in the back seat, so I did. Gets back there. 
takes off my pants and he continued to rape me. I was screaming and crying and begging him to stop, but not once did he stop. And Harriet may not have been alone. As part of a proposed class action lawsuit, a dozen other women have alleged that the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children and the province did not protect them from staff like Williams. Among their claims, Williams sexually abused them while they were at the home. At the Halifax airport, Harriet Johnson arrives on her journey to confront the ghosts of her past. She won't be making it alone. Thankfully, Tracy Dorrington, also a former resident, is there to meet her. I knew Harriet well. Harriet was my baby sister. What do you remember about her? This little girl with big brown eyes and these great big braids. <gasps> There's Tracy! She and her son were coming down off the escalator and I said, oh my God, there's Harriet. She had her hair braided in these braids and I said, that's my little sister. <laughs> oh my God, Whoa. When you heard what had happened to her? I was sick. All I could do was cry because I know what happened to me and I know how it made me feel. What happened to you? Quite often I was fondled in my sleep. I was woken out of my sleep and taken into the parents' house where staff had sex with me. Tracy is one of the women who are part of the lawsuit against the home claiming abuse by Williams. And they claim he wasn't the only one who preyed on the girls. Uh, Herbie Desmond was the biggest perpetrator. He threw me up against the wall. I tried to fight him off. And I knew I couldn't get him off me. He was just too strong. And um, he raped me. How old were you? I was probably about 13, 14. Did you tell any staff member? No, I ran in the shower. And I scrubbed and I scrubbed. I just wanted him off me. Why didn't you tell anyone? Well, I was scared to tell because I was told that if I told, no one would believe me. No one's ever gonna believe me. You're a tomboy, you're ugly. Who the hell's gonna believe you? Seriously? Yeah. Back then, Herbie Desmond was a childcare worker. Tracy claims he abused her for years. In court documents, other past residents allege similar stories of sexual and emotional abuse by Desmond. Two alleged perpetrators, almost 20 victims, and claims the home and the government knew and did nothing about it. Past residents like Tracy and Harriet suffered in silence. They had nowhere to turn until they found social worker Jane Earle. Jane was the type of woman that just put you at ease. Jane is married to Gordon Earl, Nova Scotia's first black member of parliament. Together, they fostered many children from the orphanage. In the 1990s, some of their foster kids began to disclose physical and sexual abuse. And the truth is that when they brought it forward to staff members, the few that had the nerve to do that, they weren't listened to. They were told consistently. Nobody will believe you. Nobody wants you. Harriet learned that lesson herself. I recall um, different occasions with Mr. Williams, actually, that he would um, kiss me on the lips. Every time he would come in, I was told by a female staff to stop kissing him on the lips. The female staff told you? Yes. This is an adult male kissing you on the lips? Yes. I said, no, he's kissing me. They did not believe me and nothing was done. So they took the side of the staff member and ignored the child. It was always like that. We didn't matter to them. But they did matter to Jane Earl. In the late 1990s, Tracy confided in her about the abuse she hid for so many years. As soon as I talked to Tracy, she'd asked me if I could set up a meeting with the board and she didn't want to embarrass uh, the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. She didn't want to embarrass them? She didn't want to embarrass them. You know, it's very difficult with the racism down here and finally having an icon organization, which was what we thought at the time. And I said to her that I would talk with the executive director and set up that meeting. I couldn't believe that they would refuse. She just wanted to talk to them, to tell them what her yes. story. She didn't want money. She didn't want to go to the court. She didn't want to go to the police. She just wanted them to know so that no other child would suffer like she had. Why do you think they said no? I don't think they wanted to hear it. Because to the community, the home was this wonderful place. 
It was a great place for black children to be raised. And so to bring any, to taint that community idea of what's going on in the home, that wasn't going to happen. Protect the reputation at all costs. The reputation of the home. Next, victims reunite to share their suffering. They will receive justice. As more horrors come to light. He died. And you were told to shut your mouth. Yes. When W5 continues. Halifax, Nova Scotia. W5 is here investigating an historic cover-up. Past residents of this orphanage, the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, claim this was more like a house of horrors. At the age of 43, former resident Harriet Johnson has come back. Love you, Mom Jane. I just love seeing you two hug each other at the airport. <laughs> that was just... Tracy Dorrington and Jane Earle are here for support. Today is when Harriet returns to the home for the first time since she was a child. Our Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the life that you've given us, Lord. Go with us throughout this day, in Jesus' name. And bless with Tracy for all the support she's given everybody because she's a sister, a true sister. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Are you ready? Okay, guys, let's do this. <laughs> Before they visit the orphanage, Harriet needs to meet who she calls her brothers and sisters in suffering. Past residents with their own stories of abuse. They're waiting inside the law office of Wagner's, the firm behind the class action lawsuit. Stacy Beals was in the home during the 1970s. Jerry Morrison in the 1950s. Paul Carvery was there in the 1960s. And Robert Borden, he was everybody's big brother. He was our protector. He didn't let people mess with us if he knew about it. He, he fought for us. You got lipstick all over your shirt. Oh my God. Bored. It's bored. Oh my God. You're still ugly as ever, though. Yeah. <laughs> and you still feel. There goes my toughness now. Huh? <laughs> They're all survivors. Some haven't seen each other in years. Some are meeting for the first time. Gathered to support Harriet in the journey to confront her past and to share their own stories. And I remember sitting on my little bed there up there crying out to my mother. They come get me. Come get me to help me. Cause it's because they're hurting me. Yeah. And there's no there. There's no one around. There's there. Jane Earl has heard countless stories of neglect and abuse. That's why she's Mama Earl to everyone here. And you made me understand that they can't hurt me anymore. They couldn't hurt me anymore. And I want to thank you for giving me the courage to come forward and to be as strong as you have helped me to get. And for that, I thank you so much. You don't know the impact that you've had on my life. You I don't know through anything like you guys have gone through, and I don't know. But you've given us the strength. You've helped us to learn our voice and be able to take back our lives. And you're doing that, my God. You're doing me proud. You're doing me proud. About 100 former residents are part of this proposed class action lawsuit. They probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this man, Tony Smith. He was the first to speak out publicly, the first to expose the darkness behind the walls. It is an honor to meet you, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you. You have no idea how your story had an impact on my life. Thanks. Thank you. Tony is a well-known Halifax entertainer. Music was his salvation. Tony Smith grew up in the home during the 1960s. He's the boy holding the tire. Tony remembers frightening times when staff forced the children to fight each other. 
but they would look at the two people, normally friends, and they would make you fight one another. And if you said, I'm not going to fight? You would get a beating from the staff. He will never forget a fight that targeted one of the weaker boys. One of my best friends, Tony Langford, he had a heart condition. He had a hole in his heart. Tony was only nine years old when he watched helplessly as the boys started to attack his best friend. And when this was happening, I, I tried to get out because one of them got the door closed and, and three of them was holding me back and I was yelling and they were muzzling my mouth. And then I seen he wasn't responding the way he did initially. He was slumped over helpless. Tony Langford was rushed to the hospital. I told staff what had happened and they told me to shut up and stop my lies. And if I was ever say this lie again, I'm gonna get a severe beating, worse than I ever had. Did Tony ever come back from the hospital? He died. He died? He died. And you were told to shut your mouth? Yes. He still haunts you? He doesn't haunt me. It's those people in the home, the way that they try to cover this up. Tony never had a chance to attend the funeral, never had a chance to say goodbye, until a few years ago, when he tracked down the secluded graveyard where Anthony Langford is buried. When you stood over his grave, I, I, I've always been tough. I've always been not showing my emotions, but uh, it was uncontrollable. And I, I said to him that I'm keeping my promise. You will not be forgotten. Your promise is what? I said that I'm going to let it be known what happened to him, that he didn't die in vain. I love you. <laughs> Come on in. Lawyer Ray Wagner is convinced stories like Tony's are part of a systematic cover-up. This is the uh, case on litigation up to this point in time. This is huge. This is incredible. According to Wagner, these records reveal from the 1920s until the 1980s, the home and the government ensured any whisper of abuse or neglect was silenced. When you start seeing the, over and over and over again the beatings, the abuse, the mental abuse, and the very, very severe sexual abuse uh, by a number of people, uh, you just start, have to start to believe. In one of the most striking examples, in 1954, a social worker reports, as I have received several other complaints about the children being abused, I feel it is time that a thorough investigation was made as to just what is going on there. That never happened. In 1973, the government resisted scrutiny again, fearing a survey of the home would spark a witch hunt at the department's expense. I mean, what's really criminal here is they could have stopped things back in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, but they did nothing. Where were the authorities? Where was the government? Where were the children's aid societies? Wagner thinks racism lies at the heart of this historical injustice. To understand that, take a look at this film we found in our archives. W5 went to Nova Scotia in the 1960s to visit the country's oldest black neighborhood, Africville. Uh, the Negroes basically uh, live in segregated areas. Homeowners paid taxes but were denied services like running water and paved roads. I'm in Nova Scotia, and in Nova Scotia, certain things work and certain things don't. Other people can say, look how far we've come. I say, look how far we've got to go. Watching this, it's not surprising to learn that for years, white orphanages were getting three times more money than the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. That ran up to the mid-1970s when they were trying to get more funding because it was so terribly underfunded by the province. Smacks of racism. It's a sad history. Let me tell you something. The government put us there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They put us there sure did. and forget about us. They could have told somebody, and they didn't. I used to think none of them knew. Oh, they know. And they yeah. knew. And they, they knew. Covered. Yeah. They covered. And I'm going to encourage every kid that I run into that from the home to tell their story. Yeah. Because people need to know. People need to know what happened at the home. That's right. Because they've, they've thrived on us not talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you hear of the staff who abuse the kids, who abused you, that are still out there. Do you hope one day that you get an opportunity to confront them? Unfortunately for me and a lot of other people, because of our age, uh, the majority of the people that were our abusers are no longer alive. Fortunately for some of the younger generation, um, we do know that there's strong allegations. 
they will receive justice. This stuff has come out. You would think that the government would say, we need a major league investigation. Absolutely. There is no, absolute no excuse. They were throwaway children and they still are for the government, but not for us. Next, confronting a horrible past. <laughs> and finding the strength to carry on. I am not that weak little girl anymore. When W5 continues. Welcome back to W5. We have heard horrific and heartbreaking stories of child abuse, neglect, beatings, and sexual assault from a group of black Nova Scotians who have worked up the courage to take their case to the courts. Anger has turned to action. As Victor Malarik is about to show us in the throwaway children, they hope it also leads to healing. In the heart of Preston, a black community just outside Halifax, this empty building was once the Nova Scotia home for colored children. For many former residents, it represents the heart of their nightmares. Paul Carvery and Stacy Beals have gathered here today to reflect on their shared legacy of abuse. Basically what it was, it was a, a prison. That's what it was, man, like, you know what I mean? There was no love, no nutrient, Put you in, no the, put you in like the corner that. for hours on you end. Oh, remember, yeah. go stand in the corner? Yes, I remember that, man. And I used to stand in the corner from sometimes it would turn dark out, mm -hmm. and I'd be still in the corner. Yeah. Don't turn around. Don't even, <laughs> know, what you did. Turn around, Don't even know what you did wrong. Yeah, then you okay. saw someone. Robert Borden spent his entire childhood in this building, now just a shell. The social workers? Mm -hmm. We all had them. Did anybody see any? <laughs> I never seen no, none in there. What do you no, mean? No, they come and got me. I seen true. one. I seen one when they come and got me and put me in the parcel home. When they took you. Yeah. Yeah, then you saw okay. someone. And lied to me and told me I was going back to my real family. You understand what I mean? They yeah, just, yeah. everything was. It was always false premises. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I get there and they ain't my real family. When you talk about being abused by staff, what'd they do to you? They beat, beat me. They sexually molested me. I had certain staff tell me that I was nothing, right? That if I thought that somebody cared, I was wrong. Many former staff are named in sworn affidavits filed in support of the class action lawsuit. But Robert alleges two of the worst were Georgie Williams, the home's driver, and Herb Desmond, a childcare worker. Robert remembers them bragging about their conquest. They were having sex with the girls. You know how you have a buddy? that you tell something to, you, you boast about. That happened with me a lot, with the staff. Georgia himself told me he was smacking that ass. You know, he told me himself. All right, and, and another thing he said to me about how tight someone's vagina was. One summer night in 1983 was the turning point. For Robert, that's when Williams, in particular, crossed the line. It's all laid out here in this court document obtained by W5. This major incident report from June 6, 1983, the alleged rape of a 14-year-old resident by Georgie Williams. Robert remembers the girl came back after a long drive with Williams. She jumped out of the car. She was bawling. She ran into the home. I asked Georgie, what's wrong with her? He told me she was upset about her boyfriend. That was his explanation. I asked him why, why the windows were so all fogged up and why was he sweating? He said, it was just hot in here. Anyway, I gotta go into the home. Parked the car and went in. And who was that girl who reported Georgia Williams had raped her? She wishes to remain anonymous and hasn't joined the class action suit. But court documents reviewed by W5 disclosed that as a result of the rape, she required 18 stitches. Back at the home, the girl was punished for speaking out, hassled and beaten up, not by staff, but by another 14-year-old resident named Tessie Brooks. Tessie is now 45 years old and lives in Ottawa. She's been protecting George Williams for years, until now. 
She breaks down even before we start talking. I waited a long time because yeah. I didn't know what decision to take. It's it rough when you have to talk about the past, you know? Tessie still hasn't forgiven herself for what happened back in June 1983. She was emotionally torn, crying, and she said, Georgie raped me. And I pretty much turned my back on her, didn't help her. I was a kid myself, and I wish I could have helped her. <laughs> I wish I could have helped and I, and I, and I could help When Georgie told you to go and shut the girl up, what did you do? I agreed with him. I tried to like, tell her to be quiet. Tessie says Williams preyed on her as well. She says he was having sex with her when she was only 14 years old. Everybody looked up to Georgie, but he wasn't the person that we all thought that he was. Why was it that they would look up to him? His, his charming ways, he was pleasant. He would pretend he's for us, but really he knew what, why he was being polite to us, because he wanted to abuse us. If you had a chance today to speak to the girl, what would you say to her today? I'm extremely sorry. I wish I was able to help her. I love her. I'm really, really sorry. And how did the home react after learning about the rape of a 14-year-old girl? The board considered reporting this crime to the police and that maybe Georgie Williams should go to jail for his actions. But they didn't. According to their own document, the board chose to shelve this idea, pending further investigation. The home dismissed Williams, but they never informed the police. Harriet Johnson has never seen this report. She alleges Georgie Williams raped her when she was a child living in the home. Do you realize what they could have stopped long ago? I'm, I'm speechless as I, as I read this because I cannot believe that they knew that they had already, somebody must have already came forward to the directors about what he's done. This is documentation about it. Yeah. And nothing was done. It's time for Harriet to confront the past she fled 30 years ago. Her friends wait while she struggles to walk up the driveway. She can't run away from the home anymore. She needs to face it. She hasn't been here since she was a child. It's okay to cry. Remember, we're talking cleansing tears, okay? He can't hurt you. He can't hurt you no more. We're bigger than him. It's all boarded up. Only thing in there is bad memories. It was the first time that I'd been back there for a long time. I was never wanting to set foot on that property again because it was painful. But I had been involved a lot longer than she had, so I had had an opportunity to develop some skills to deal with, you know, painful stuff. But she had, and so I kind of pulled it together for her, more so than myself. I look at that. I remember the worker driving me up here, just leaving me inside of that, that place. They were supposed to protect me, not hurt me in here. I hate this building, I hate it. I hate it. That's the basement. They used to take us and beat us there. And if we moved, they would hold us by one hand and just keep going and going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> damn it, damn, damn you! Damn it! I see the kids again in here. Airborne and they hurt me bad. They hurt me bad. 
They never Creatures. expected us to get strong, that's why they hurt us. We couldn't fight back then. But we can fight back now. Today's visit was supposed to be a healing journey. But what happens next opens old wounds. An uninvited guest arrives at their reunion. The current executive director of the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, Veronica Marsman. Lock her, lock her out. Don't let her out. And I'm allowed to walk on the two feet Harriet. God gave me any time I want. The name's Harriet, Harriet Johnson. Harriet. Excuse Get me, it please. right. Remember the 1983 alleged rape that the board didn't report to the police? Veronica Marsman was the supervisor who first investigated it. Excuse me, please. Excuse you, please? Yep. Give me one reason why should I excuse you. Because you're in my way. I'm in your way? Harriet recalls well, calling Veronica about Williams you. a year ago. You told the executive director your story. Yes. And nothing happened? Nothing happened. Here it is almost a year later. I'm still waiting to be contacted back. Back Go right ahead, Veronica. Go right ahead, Veronica. Seriously. You can't even explain why you didn't call me back last year when I called you, spoke to you personally, and told you what Georgie Williams did. The only way you're going to get away from me is go that way. I am not that weak little girl anymore. We want to know why Veronica showed up here today. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But no luck. Seeing Veronica Marsman pull up in her car, what did it do? That's the same treatment we got when we were kids. You weren't important as a child, you're not important as an adult. She could have answered the question. She chose, her decision was to run, to run away, right? Avoid it. Coward. Like, it's been avoided for so many years. Not just by her, by, by other staff, other government. You know, was, we're not important to them. Next. Terrible memories that will never fade. Why did no one stop the abuse in this house of horrors? You're talking about beatings, even rape. Not all of the experiences were bad. When W5 continues. The Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children was supposed to be a haven for orphaned and abandoned black children. Today, the organization is facing a massive class action lawsuit. Sylvia Paris is on the board of directors. Veronica Marsman is the executive director. She was the unwelcome guest at this reunion. Excuse me, please. Back in goddamn car. We'll Go right ahead, Veronica. Go right ahead, crazy? Veronica. Back your Seriously. Car. Seriously, you think I'm going to move? All those men and women who were there today were telling us stories of, of, of the abuses. And then you showed up and, whoa, it was like someone ignited a... A fire, yeah. Mm hmm Unfortunate for me. Some of the former residents remember Veronica when she was a child. She lived at the home for two years during the 1960s. Veronica has fond memories of an institution that cared for thousands of black children. Even today, the home exists in a newer building. It's a short-term residence for children of all races. The Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children has impacted and touched just about every black home in the province. And by either their family members or their aunts or uncles working here, or they had somebody who was placed at the home. And... Um, yeah, not all of the experiences were bad. Not all of the experiences were bad, but those not. that were bad were serious. You know, you're talking about beatings, you're talking about sexual abuse, yeah. even rape. And those are the matters that are before the courts right now. So there is a process in place for people to deal with that. We're ensuring that the practices that we have today are on the right track and they're going in the right direction. That's where we're at but there's still an unfinished past. We tell her about the 1983 major incident report, the alleged rape of a 14-year-old girl by Georgie Williams, reported directly to Veronica Marsman, who was one of the supervisors at the time. The board discussed it. They thought, maybe we should go to the police. It's right here in, in, in your own documents. And it says, well, this idea was shelved pending further investigation. Did this, this came I've from... I've not seen that document. Yeah, I know, but I mean, at that time you were a supervisor. You, you must have been aware of it. And what was the outcome? 
it was shelved and Mr. Williams was, was, uh, was dismissed. Okay, so... Yeah. So, I mean, certainly we're not in a position to speak to, to that. I'm not even clear if I even knew exactly um, what did take place. But according to the report, back then, Veronica Marsman conducted a thorough investigation. Former resident Robert Borden says he remembers June 1983 like it was yesterday. Veronica Marsman was at the home when this incident of the rape occurred. Do you recall whether she was aware of this? But if she was there, she was aware. Everybody knew about it the next day, so she was aware. You're telling me that when you were a supervisor at this time, you were never aware that George Williams was dismissed and why he was dismissed? Oh, I'm not saying that I wasn't aware of why he was dismissed. I said I'd like to know there's more details to that, actual circumstances that I'd like to you can go back and review. That's been several years now, many yeah. years. There's all there's kinds of different <laughs> levels of accountability, though. There's only one because accountability when a crime is committed. You go to the police or an alleged crime or a suspected crime. Mm -hmm. There's documents that are provided, like we have to, you know, there's forms that have to be filled out even back then. There's only meant. one way to deal with an allegation of rape. And I you go the to the police. I think it would be irresponsible in terms of the facts and acknowledging what the facts are to make a comment on it. So what happened to the alleged abusers, Herb Desmond and Georgie Williams? As part of the proposed class action, about 20 women claimed they were sexually assaulted by them while they were children at the home. As seen here, Herb Desmond is still living in Coal Harbor. He ended up at the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. After this abuse scandal surfaced, he took an extended leave of absence. W5 tried repeatedly to speak to Herbert Desmond. He won't answer our letters requesting an on-camera interview but has previously denied the allegations. You hear Herbie Desmond is on the Human Rights Commission. Shock you? I was thinking, did they not check into his past? But he wouldn't have been on the child abuse registry because nobody spoke up. And what about Georgie Williams? W5 made repeated attempts to speak with him. He won't answer our calls or letters, but we track him down in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, keeping a low profile. If you saw him in front of you right now, what would you say to him? I would say to him, what you've done to me, you will one day pay. I will get justice for what he's done to me. After Georgie Williams was dismissed from the home, where did he end up? At the East Preston Daycare Center as a school bus driver. After allegations about his past became public, the daycare suspended Williams. He ripped the innocence from these children. Krista Dix has read all the graphic details about his alleged crimes. It's even better. Krista Dix's daughter, Peyton, was at the East Preston daycare. Georgia Williams drove her to school every day. Disgusting to think that he got away with it then, and then the potential was there all over again, and nobody did anything about it. You want to go forward. You want to do good things. We are doing both. Yeah. But you've got a past that is like a nightmare when, when you hear from these people. I mean, maybe not for you, and maybe not for you, but boy, this hangs over them, and it's not been dealt with. It is people's memory of an aspect of our past, but there's a full past that is, is we're hopeful will come out as well. And your aim, your goal is today and the future. Always, but reflecting always on our past. I mean, the past is who we are. Tony Smith's past still haunts him, but it hasn't defeated him. He married his college sweetheart, Chalice, and they have a beautiful family, the kind of family Tony could only have dreamed of as a child. How do you hope all this will end? There's no saying. The truth hurts and the truth will set you free. If they accept the truth, the truth will free us all to move forward. And that's what I'm looking for. Social worker Jane Earl has made it her mission to raise awareness of this alleged legacy of abuse. What should happen? 
a public inquiry should be held so that they have a chance to publicly talk about what was done to them and how it's ruined their lives. I'm amazed that some of them have gotten their lives together so well. Absolutely amazed. But they're still hurting. But they're still hurting. What keeps you going? My girls. I have two beautiful girls. And um, some days when I'm just feeling really low, my youngest who's still at home with me, she hugs me and she says, Mommy, it's going to be okay. And I know that it will be okay eventually. Because she loves her mommy. Because she loves her mommy. It's the kind of love that was missing from all their childhoods, a suffering that unites them all. I'm going forward with my brothers, Tony, Stacy, Stacy, Jerry, Jerry, get over here. My, my brothers and my sisters, we're going to go forward from here and put all of the pain behind us. We're going to stand together and bring each other's predator down to justice. So, Father, we just pray for a wonderful solution to all of this, that those who are unable to find their voice will find it through this little group. And we just pray that it will continue to grow bigger and stronger, and that we know that together we can accomplish all. In these blessings we ask in your name. Amen. 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 Amen.